Look, I'm just a geologist. I like rocks. I love rocks. Welcome to the Geology Flannel Cast, everybody. I'm Steve. I'm Chris. I'm Jesse. And who do we have with us today? Introduce yourself. I am, I am Kelly. I am the guest person today. So, Yay. yeah. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it turns out we just sent a bunch of emails to random people named Kelly, and this one answered. So, congrats. Mm -hmm. And we may get some people dropping in, which is yeah, that's true. The random yeah. emails that we sent it to. So we're looking forward to that. No Surprise. full full disclosure. I apologize to Kelly, our guest. Uh, I spent, I sent what four emails to four different email addresses. None of them were right. <laughs> well oiled <laughs> machine here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, I did send Gosh. one to one that was actually her account, but it was her account back in 2010 or something. Yep. So give or take. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for having thanks me back. For Thank on. you, Kelly. Um, so let's start off with Jesse's corner. Well, first let's need let's thank our sponsor, uh, the oh, formatting formula. Let's pay the bills first. Yeah, man. Uh, has anyone ever had to tackle? a work document, a thesis or dissertation, anything in word, and you're not familiar with it, uh, go to the formatting formula, watch their videos on YouTube. Um, there are literally like hundreds of videos on YouTube for both for word, for both PC and Mac and all different kinds of word versions. Like, you know, wait, I don't know when did it start 2009 or something version all the way up to what's the latest version. I don't even know word 2016. 365 2016 365 crazy i don't know so anyway um, well before the, 2009. exactly so they have step-by-step -step videos to go through headings number table of contents like all that random stuff that you know you don't really need to struggle with so just go to youtube.com slash formatting formula um you know type in a comment say like hey i heard this on the geology flannel cast and then you know, we'll get props for it too. So thanks. Uh, we also just recently, um, by just recently, I mean like 25 minutes ago, uh, set up a Patreon account. Uh, so you can go to uh, patreon.com and slash geology flannel cast and help support us that way. Every little bit helps with that. Um, and for yeah. those of you who don't know, what, what is that? Because I actually don't know what that is. It's like GoFundMe? Yeah. So Patreon is like a GoFundMe for podcasts or YouTube or, oh, or things like that. I didn't know so, that. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a PayPal on the back end. So, you know, you donate to us. They take a small percentage and the rest comes to us. They handle all the credit card numbers or PayPals or, you know, however you want to pay for it. Well, we, it helps us cover some of the, like we have web hosting fees and all these other just little fees that uh, yeah we're you know even with our formatting formula who's awesome and thank you for supporting us uh we're, we still don't make money we still lose money <laughs> on this <laughs> podcast currently um so you know if we could just get out of the red and into the black that that would be nice um yeah you know, i wouldn't mind driving a maserati either so if you guys really <laughs> want to step this up <laughs> I wouldn't hold your breath on that one, but patreon.com slash geology flannel cast. If you would like to help out the show, we have a couple different tiers set up. It's very, very affordable. So um, thanks to everyone in advance for helping out with that. If you choose. Um, so yeah, I guess. Uh, let's every, every little bit helps, you know, but you know, if you've got some extra cash lying around, you want to help us out. We'd appreciate it. If you like what you hear, you should donate. That's, see? Yeah. Kelly Blake, man. <laughs> Tearing it up already. <laughs> so there'll also be, there's a couple different tiers set up with a couple different, um, uh, you get some extra extra access and things like that you can check out. Um, yeah. Like watching watching the flannel cast live as we record them on over Zoom or, or whatever platform we end up using. You can chat with us before. Um, before each episode and kind of small things like that or you can just get some stickers out of the deal so yeah, here's a sticker so mm -hmm. if you listen to the podcast you're not seeing the sticker but. yeah the, the stickers only go to the first uh 2000 subscribers because that's all i have 
<laughs> but I guess if we get 2,000 subscribers, I could probably afford some more stickers. Yeah. We'll see. Maybe Jesse will get those t-shirts one of these oh, days. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my husband's it? still really bad about the lack of t-shirt, by the way. Oh, He's man. like, are they still talking about those t-shirts? I was like, oh, yeah. I've, I've got them all. I've, I invested in a screen printing operation. <laughs> That's the long, <laughs> it's just like the long game. That's what you're playing here. Yeah, yep. exactly. So tweaking my dyes. I want to make the colors <laughs> just right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I really need. Flannel cast red. Really need this Patreon to pay back my, my creditors. <laughs> or we did an episode about debt, debtor's prison. Jesse will go to debtor's prison. <laughs> yeah. Who, who um, that? William Smith? He was William Smith. Yeah, yeah, William Stratus Smith. Real learned about debtor's prison yeah real bummer well um, all right so uh any other uh i don't think we have any other uh, right now we don't have any right other now. sponsors we're good we're good we're okay. always on the lookout <laughs> <laughs> all kelly, right kelly's a navy looking to uh sponsor us or i don't think so but oh, okay I could bring it to the my leadership. <laughs> All right, so you're saying there's a chance. Yeah, for sure. There's always a chance. All you're right. just not making any promises at all. Let me get the Blue Angels to fly through my basement. <laughs> Do you want that to happen? I mean, it would probably be pretty cool. It would be it the. Would be. The last thing you see, but it would be. <laughs> yeah. Wait, can you do it on a Monday night so we can see it too? <laughs> yeah. Man, you need to stream that. Yeah. Then for yeah. sure. I'm the host of this Zoom right now, so you'd lose all that footage. Uh, uh, oh, that's true. Uh, I'll I'll make sure I host that one. Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. All right, Jesse, you wanna you wanna kick off your your segment of the show? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will, Very good. I will say you do need it. You need a jingle of some sort, like you guys were talking about last time. Yes. I think it would so, be great. It doesn't do have to be involved, but. I want to give a, if someone's working on the jingle, I want to yeah. say you better hurry, because my current TA for my class this semester has said he is going to try and come up with one. He used to be a musician. I guess he still is a musician. Once you're a musician, you're always a musician. Is that how? I don't know. I play like the bike. Yeah, I played the trumpet mm -hmm. in middle school, but I wouldn't consider myself a musician. Um, He's a musician, uh, like we're podcasters. <laughs> <laughs> he was. He, he used to get paid for it, though. So. Oh. Uh, yeah. yeah, and he's better than us. <laughs> Legitimate. So, uh, yeah, son of a. Uh, anyway, that's all I want to. That's my Jesse's corner. Just ranting about that. <laughs> So I got two things to I got two things to talk about here. Um, the first I thought was sort of interesting was I just stumbled upon um, I, I I heard heard about this and I actually found a legitimate article for it that Chris can put up on the on the website for y'all. Um, and it's the price of oil is so cheap now. That's, that sounds like a setup of a joke, right? How cheap is it? Oh, thanks, <laughs> uh, that um, cargo ships are avoiding the Suez Canal, and they're actually going all the way around Africa, the Cape of Good Hope, to deliver their goods to wherever they're going. Um, because it's cheaper? It's cheaper, yeah. It's cheaper oil cost than to pay the Suez Canal fees. Wow. How about so, that? Yeah, cost. that's a, that's great for climate change. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I was wondering if they were just taking the long way because they figured by the time it gets to port, it'd be worth more money than what <laughs> it is now. They're, well, they're like, everyone's on lockdown. Does it really matter if it takes us an extra two weeks? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, it does. When I order my stuff on Amazon, I, I want it there tomorrow. <laughs> a good consumer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, I thought that was sort of interesting. Um, you know, yeah. A little bit of commerce and little, economics in here, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I, I've been buying all the empty barrels that I can so I can just fill them in my backyard. Yeah. There's nothing, I don't need a permit for that or anything, right? You know, <laughs> keep it in your basement and then when the yeah, blue angels exactly. come over. Is that, isn't there an uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia? Uh, there yeah, is an Always Sunny there. episode. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Wild card. Wild card. <laughs> uh, uh, that's like my favorite episode. <laughs> so, number two on the Look at me keeping this nice and tight and concise. Yeah, man. Number two, uh, 
Steve actually sent to me. So I did no legwork on this. I did pull up, I pulled up the actual research article. I will say that. Uh, I did copy and paste and then yeah. send. Got it to the <laughs> email. I received it. Yep. But it's an interesting story about um, the, they're doing some, I guess, remote sensing work on Greenland. And I think they've identified um, these uh, outwash canyons that were created by these mega floods during the, the Plyo and Pleistocene. So during the Pliocene, there's this warming and like sea level goes up. It's an interglacial before you get into the big ice ages of the Pleistocene. But there was thought that Greenland has been covered with ice through that. And now it looks like that uh, might not have been as covered as we thought. There might've been a lot of um, glacial outwash. So that these catastrophic outburst floods it's very similar to if you're familiar with the Scablands in the Pacific Northwest. And who isn't? Yeah, <laughs> which we should. Uh, the Scablands would be an interesting, interesting topic to to talk about. Um, but well, yeah, so thought it was very interesting. The Grand Canyon of Greenland um, is hmm. what they're what they're calling it. So, for some listeners that may not know what um, glacial outwash is, that's essentially kind of as the as these glaciers are melting the water's coming off and it's bringing it's bringing these these the, all this sediment down that was all locked up in that in that ice and so when you see glacial outwash it's just these like essentially these lobes of sediment this, this big pile of sediment just it's all this stuff that came off the ice as it was melted as the ice melted and the water brought all that sediment down to so this is this is sort of that is technically glacial outwash um the sediments but this is actually incision from these catastrophic outburst floods so it, oh, it okay. gets ice dammed a little bit as it's melting chunks of the ice break off and they dam up the channel of all this meltwater and it piles up all this water and then if some of those bergs or whatever come loose or they melt enough you get this just massive release of, en of, of water an energy that causes down cutting or erosion. I had to map that in field camp in Idaho, like not knowing any glacial geology whatsoever, other than what I had learned on field camp and like seeing these random granite boulders in the middle of where they shouldn't be. And they're like, how did they get here? And it's like, what the hell is going on? Uh, <clears throat> Like it, it, we had a, I forget, like eight days to map it. And it wasn't until like day six where I was like, oh, that's what it is. <laughs> Eureka. Yeah. Um, yeah. Shout out to Lehigh Field Camp. Awesome field camp. But um, yeah. Oh, I think that's two weeks in a row we mentioned Lehigh Field Camp. It is. <laughs> so this should be a sponsor. Oh, sure. there you go. Uh, if anybody's listening from Lehigh, <laughs> just saying. I don't think any university right now is going to sponsor anything. I don't think the universities right now are in the can even sponsor themselves at this point. Oof. Well, oh, way to bring off. us down, Chris. Way to bring us down. <laughs> I'm a realist. Come on. Well, it's hard economic times. Anyways, <laughs> um, no. So that's that's interesting that they're they're use, you're using uh, ground penetrating radar cutting through the ice because. Oh. Uh, ground penetrating radar or GPR uh, can see through ice really well, like really, really far. Like, mm. you know, in your backyard might see what a couple feet, Chris, depending upon your soil. But, yeah, you, 10 feet tops, but it depends how much clay you have. Right. But then in ice, you can see like hundreds of feet. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah, um, it's, I've never used, I, I use a lot of GPR in my research. I never use GPR in ice, but you hear like it's just like crystal clear and just that signal penetrates all the way down. So, mm -hmm. It'd be pretty cool to check that out, but yeah, um, they found a uh, asteroid, no meteorite, asteroid, something impacted Greenland, and that's how they found it with GPR and the oh. help of the warming climate and melting ice sheet. Two so. weeks ago, we've talked about that impact, right? Yeah, no, no, three. It was listener questions three weeks ago. We're uh, yeah, we're already repeating ourselves. It's time to. <laughs> Time to hang it up. Just yeah, We're pack out. It in. <laughs> We're done. See everyone in five years. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, good times. So that, that's all I've got for. That's, uh, those are the issues of the day. Not too much rant and raving going on this week. 
No, I'm keeping it an even keel. I don't want to get you're, myself. You're all heated last week. This week, you're like, yeah, it's it's <laughs> fine. Everything's good. <laughs> okay. Give me a few days. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting worked up again. Yeah, I'm getting yeah. filled up already. <laughs> all right. Well, let's uh, let's uh, segue over to our main topic of the of the podcast today. We have we have Kelly Blake here. Uh, Kelly is a structural geologist, and uh, Kelly, you want to you want to say a few like what do you do, Kelly? Who are you? Sure. Um, so I have been on the show before, the podcast mm-hmm. before, whichever the correct terminology is, um, talking about geothermal energy. So that was back quite a while ago, five or six years ago, I guess. At this point, yeah. crazy. Um, was that long mm-hmm. ago? I can't believe it was that long <laughs> <Yes>. ago. <laughs> oh. Talking about my job in geothermal, I'm still at the same office um, working on um, with geothermal energy. So with the drop in oil prices, a lot of geologists may be interested in another career path other than oil and gas. And geothermal is um, similar in its um, exploration methods. So I would suggest looking into geothermal energy. We're hopeful in the industry that... Um, it already seemed like before COVID that geothermal was going to be kind of taking a uh, turn back up. Um, it's been a bit of a lull for a little while. Um, but with the drop in oil prices, um, we're looking for to grab some good oil and gas people over the geothermal industry. So take a look at geothermal if you are looking for something um, and you have some geophysical, um, geoscience, structural geology, all applicable in geothermal exploration as well. That's my plug for geothermal. Very cool. cool. So, um, we, so yeah, how, so I live in, go ahead. Sorry, Chris. Uh, I was going to, how, how long, just for the listeners, how long have you been working in geothermal now? I've been working in geothermal for nine years. So after I left Temple with all of these guys, um, I moved out to California. Um, there's a naval base in the middle, middle of the desert of California um, called um, <laughs> Naval <laughs> Air Weapons Station, China Lake. Um, and the town that I live in is called Ridgecrest, and I've lived here for nine years, and I've worked as a geologist. And now, um, just within the last year, actually, I've been put, um, my new title is division director. So I'm Ooh, in charge of that Oh, director. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Fancy pants. Now, Ridgecrest, yeah. California. Why have I heard of that recently? Mm-hmm. 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 So basically, no one knows where Ridgecrest, California is. I have to bring up a map usually when I'm explaining where it is in California, it's in the high desert, but it was known this past year and got to be a little more well-known because there were some large magnitude earthquakes. Um, just um, a few miles to my, where I'm sitting right now, a few miles to my east, um, a 6.4 magnitude earthquake on July 4th, 2019, and then a 7.1 magnitude earthquake on July 5th, 2019. That so you guys got some crazy. real fireworks on the 4th of July then, both in the yes. air and on the ground. So Kelly, I have to ask this, you know, as the podcast conspiracy theorist, uh, did you cause these? Was it from <laughs> no. the geothermal? Uh, no, but it's interesting because we live, um, because of where we are, the geothermal field is not far away. Um, so that was brought up, but it was definitely, we are um, not anywhere close to creating earthquakes this large. Um, that and it's a weapons testing station. So that was also a question was, mm. did the Navy cause these earthquakes, but also not the case? No, um, that, there. Uh, you know, I am not a structural geologist, but uh, 6.4 or 7.1 magnitude earthquake, the strong. amount of energy that is released is redonkulous like that's you know a gazillion megatons you know <laughs> at least a gazillion give or it's take very a, scientific <laughs> give or take one so um no there are large earthquakes that are induced by fracking or things like that but not not this big as far as i know but no nothing this big usually there is in place that um especially where they are doing some um, they are creating fractures. There are um, like stop and go, like stoplight, like green, yellow, red. So if you get to a magnitude, say three, um, then that's yellow. And if you got to a magnitude five, then you are basically shut down. Um, and there's um, examples of that in Italy, definitely. Um, yeah, I'm looking they, at Oklahoma had a, they set off a, a 5.8 yeah. earthquake there. So 
And I'd assume yeah. ejection had to be scaled back, but I, I don't know what their induced, it's called an induced seismicity mitigation plan. Um, so if you're inducing large magnitude earthquakes, then you'd have to back off on whatever it is you're doing to cause them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just for the lay person listening, uh, a 5.0 magnitude earthquake and a 6.0 magnitude earthquake are, you know, one is not one order of magnitude or one, a five is not, uh, it's not linear, right? Yes. Thank it's you. It's exponential. Jeez. Yeah. But, but it's not, it's not true logarithmic. Is that correct? Um, I, I know it's on a log um, scale, but it's not a log 10 base 10 scale. Log 33. Thank you. It's a log 33. So, um, <clears throat> even a, a five to a six is not a hundred, to, uh, 10 times bigger. It's like 33 times. Yeah. bigger because yeah. so. a, a five to a seven is nine it's almost a thousand times there you go Damn. see that that's crazy oh, man i'm so glad i'm the mathematician on this podcast because <laughs> <laughs> uh how many times did i take calc one and two <laughs> four, four you said it last time <laughs> yeah see i can't I'm even count that checking out. us here really yeah, yeah. Come, on. Sorry. come on kelly you're killing me <laughs> didn't mean to sorry i'm gonna last day I'm sorry. <laughs> I just think about um, it. If I had passed both of those one, one time each, we might not be friends. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. See, none of this would be happening if that was the case. Ah, so there we go. I think it's fair. Yeah. So I've got a question. I, Chris looks like he's ready for you, but um, uh, <laughs> so you're the host like, of this Zoom now, buddy. Look, looking at the <laughs> looking at the map of Ridgecrest. It's in it's in like the middle of California, which is well off of the San Andreas Fault. It is. Um, so, so what's interesting about seismicity in California, and it's not something that I really knew before these events occurred, um, is that the largest magnitude earthquakes that have occurred in California in the last like twenty years, um, actually in the last two hundred two hundred years. So it's the late 1800s when one happened north of us, um, have all happened in the Mojave Desert. So in this area um, where we are, up to the north of us, to the northwest of us, and then down to the southeast. So there's been um, large, like 7.0 magnitude plus earthquakes that have occurred on this side of the um, Sierra Nevada. And that's because um, this side of the Sierra Nevada accommodates 25% of the slip from the San Andreas Fault. So from that plate boundary, we actually on this side of the Eastern Sierra accommodate 25% of the slip that occurs along that plate boundary. So it's a really active area tectonically. Um, and it has had, and that's what I think is most interesting is San and the San Andreas Fault is very well studied, um, but there's been a crazy amount of seismicity, large, large magnitude seismicity on this side of the Eastern Sierra um, that isn't as well understood. Um, a lot of people have been working on it for a long time, but it just doesn't have the funding um, that has gone into the San Andreas Fault. So it's pretty interesting to me, the amount of seismicity that's occurred on this side of Eastern Sierra Nevada and, um, in the last like 200 years. So it sounds like there's just, well, there's not as many people living on, on the yeah, eastern just side of Sierra Nevada. Exactly. Got- Population <laughs> density. Yeah, That's yeah. very true. And if this, I mean, this... Um, earthquake were to have, have occurred in say downtown San Francisco or San Diego or LA, it would have been devastating. But yeah. um, it Lizard. was just l- lizards. I mean, it was just luckily placed where it was um, or occurred where it was, <laughs> um, where, it, where it did. And um, it just so happened to be July 4th, which is also crazy because it occurred on the base and a lot of people then were not working because it was July 4th or basically no one was out on range. So it was interesting that it occurred on July 4th. So there was basically no one out on the range along this fault scarp um, in either orientation. So it was very interesting timing. And then um, also, yeah, if you, uh, there's not many people out here for it to be a problem, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. As uh, my old geochemistry professor would say, Lizards don't vote. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's fair. So Remember people st- saying that <laughs> it was uh, it was actually fish don't vote. To paraphrase, I oh. apologize, because uh, it, it was something like, you know, major cities put 
tons and tons of garbage on barges, mm-hmm. send them off to sea, and then light them on fire. <laughs> And it was like, oh, that's awful for the environment. That's so bad. It's like, yeah, but fish don't vote. So nobody cares. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a cheaper way to get rid of it. It's cheaper than, you know, it's easier than burning it in town where people are going to complain. So let's just no, put it on a boat and send it out to sea and then we'll set it on fire. Like, oh God, that's awful. We're awful. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, well, so Kelly, this, uh, this earthquake on July 4th um, that you experienced, why what, what was that like? What, did, what, what kind of stuff did you experience during this earthquake? So prior to these two, I had experienced probably two earthquakes. Um, one here in town, it was small. It was probably a three something. Mm-hmm. And it was just like quick shake, not, mm-hmm. not too big of a deal. I was just stoked because I felt an earthquake. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I was in Nevada, I was in a hotel for work. And <clears throat> I got woken up quickly, like just right out of a full blown sleep and awake. And I was like, that was weird. And I just went back to sleep and I woke up the next morning. It was a five magnitude wow. earthquake that had woken me, like jolted me awake. Um, but it wasn't much, there wasn't much shaking of the ground because it just must've shook me up and that was it. So, um, was at home. Obviously it's July 4th. We were looking to probably go to a buddy's for a barbecue and there was a four point something, 4.6 maybe before that. And Um, My husband and I were sitting on our couch and we felt that one. And I was like, oh, dang, that was an earthquake. And then I felt (laughs) like, oh, but then I felt um, the P wave of the 6-4 and was like, oh, because we were so close to it that we would get the P wave first and and it would be a lag and you could hear it and you could hear it coming from the east and coming through all the houses um, because it was shaking it, it was moving everything to our east before it got to us. So we got jolted with the P wave, and I was like, "Ooh!" And I got up and did exactly what you're not supposed to do, everyone, and ran out of my house. Um, and and then the the S wave started, and I was like, "That was a big." And I yelled at my husband to do the same thing again. Not where you're supposed to do. You're supposed to hunker down wherever you are and find shelter wherever you are. And um, and we yeah we just went and sat outside and. Um, I sat on the ground in the backyard and just felt the earth like settle back down and it was bananas. It was just yeah. really, really interesting. <laughs> That's awesome. That is yeah. awesome. I'm not gonna lie. I'm doing the same thing. Like, yes, listen to what Kelly said, but at the same time, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm running outside. I'm like, oh. yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I wanna, can, I, can I see anything? Can I like, how do I feel this better? Like, yeah. The new motto is ride the P wave. <laughs> <laughs> So for the listeners out there that uh, if, if you don't know what a, what a P or an S wave is, essentially when there's an earthquake, there's different groupings of, of seismic waves. And it's just basically just sound. That's all. It's super low frequency sound. And the P waves are, it's the grouping of seismic waves that hit first. They travel fastest. And then the S waves come and they're a little bit slower. So Kelly, you said you could actually feel the different groupings of, of seismic waves come in. That's, that's pretty wild. That's really cool. Yeah, we got pretty good there because then it was like aftershock mm-hmm. after aftershock for a really long time. So we got pretty good at guessing yeah. the magnitude. The, the aftershocks oh, nice. are creepy, aren't they? They're, I mean, I still, um, just yesterday, because now you associate it with the sound too. So if I mm-hmm. hear something that sounds kind of like rumbling, yeah. I, I'm like, oh, I wonder if an earthquake's coming. Ooh. So it's interesting so- because it is, it is it's not what you expect it to be. And it mm-hmm. is, it was weird that you could hear them. So before that's you what could feel it. That's I, I experienced something very similar. Um, when I guess it was back in 2011, when I first moved to Virginia, I was, uh, living in Northern Virginia, just a couple of miles outside of Washington, DC. And the, um, the mineral Virginia earthquake hit. And that was like, I think a five, eight, I believe. And, um, that was crazy because I, I didn't I didn't know I didn't realize it was an earthquake. I was living I said I was living outside of DC and the first thing I thought was, oh my God, there's a but there's a terrorist attack in, in Washington. Or I thought like a giant gas explosion or something. I just didn't didn't think of, of earthquakes. But we got uh, aftershocks from that one too. And I remember like laying in bed, it was in the middle of the night and I felt the house shaking. It was that same like eerie, like it's just weird. It was just really, really eerie. And I felt that house shaking again for the, for the um, aftershock. And it was just like, whoa. Yeah, Cause that is... same earthquake when I was, I was up at Rutgers and I felt it all the way up there, but we were in my office at the time 
was a annex office, which was a glorified trailer. Uh, and so the whole trailer. <laughs> it sounds feel, fancy though. Yeah, in the annex. You could feel <laughs> it shake like in the, the direction of propagation. It was kind of, it was pretty wild. Yeah, I was, um, I was actually at Temple for that one. And I'm sitting at my desk and my chair just shakes like this. And I was sitting there like, hmm, that was odd. But, you know, I'm in the middle of the city. Like, it could have just been a bus driving by or uh, so, whatever. Um, and then I got an uh, instant message from my wife saying, like, there was an earthquake. Did you feel it? Because I was super bummed for that last Virginia earthquake. I was in, like, North <laughs> Carolina or something, and I didn't feel it. So this latest one, uh, uh, I actually felt it, and I was like, it was an earthquake. I did feel it. I did notice it. Like I was, I was so excited. And all it really was is just like, that's it. Yeah. Rumble, rumble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Kelly, how did, the, did this earthquake um, mess at all with, uh, with your work stuff, with the hydrothermal stuff you're doing? No. So what's really interesting about that is that um, it, if you were to look at a map of the strike, so that was the six four. So the six fours had a strike of Northeast um north and northeast um and that one was a i believe it was left lateral um looking at my notes to make sure i'm not crazy um yep it was a left lateral um strike slip fall and then um perpendicular to that so what was interesting is the aftershock started making this l shape and um the usgs and the cgs so you um california geological survey um, send people out in like droves. There are a lot of geologists here in town, um, which was really cool. And um, it was just a very interesting aftershock pattern. And um, with that, they were um, out here. USGS was out here. CGS was out here. They were out. Um, I was out with them looking at the rupture of the 6-4. Um, and there wasn't very much to be seen. There were definitely cracks in the desert, but nothing crazy. And with that on July 5th, um, the seven one um, cut right laterally, striking north northwest, so perpendicular, which was really cool to the six four magnitude wow. earthquake. So okay, yes. so Kelly threw out a couple terms there. Let's just um, in, <laughs> <Sorry>. case, <laughs> in case the listeners jargon, jargon. No, 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 it's, it's great, it's great. Um, so a left lateral fault. So there's uh, okay. So one type of fault there is is called a strike slip fault, and Basically, that's when, uh, how, how do you explain this just if for the podcast listeners? It's just when kind of like on it's either side, side of the phone, everything's moving side to side. Yeah. 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 yeah so, so imagine you have a bookcase, you have books on your bookshelf and your one geology textbook moved into the bookcase and the other geology book, book moved out of the yeah, bookcase. Yeah. So a left lateral fault, that's, that's uh, a type of fault, this type of strike slip fault when you look well, it, um, the opposite side of the fault that you're standing on moves to the left. So no matter what side of the fault you're standing on, the opposite side always moves to the left during a left lateral fault. So, and then a right lateral fault is when the opposite side of the fault moves to the right. So what happened was, so on July 4th, there was a left lateral fault. And then, and then on, the, on the next day, there was a what, right lateral fault. So, um, but a right lateral but, fault perpendicular, it, perpendicular to the left. So it, it sounds like it, it basically, that's actually really cool. So basically Kelly, everything's just, it just shows how everything's kind of stretching out, right? Yeah. So it's, it's moving. So those two faults were really moved in the orientation of extension that's occurring through this part of California. So, so pu pulling apart as opposed to smashing together. Right. Like, right. Like when you stretch taffy and it starts breaking a little bit in different places. Yeah. Leave it to Thornburg to relate it back to candy. I'm, I'm looking at um, the USGS's <laughs> website now. It's crazy. Like the one fault is here and the other one just cuts right through it. It's like a big cross. Yep. It's strange. Yeah. It was, it was very strange. So um, we were, and, and I'll come back to your question about the geothermal field. Sorry, in a second. Um, so we were driving for the 7-1. So we were Ooh. driving north um, um, for the 7-1. And same thing happened. Um, I was driving north. And again, this struck northeast or so, but I was driving north. I got shoved to the west um, in my car. So the P wave shoved me west. Holy and then crap. it just started shaking, like brrr, shaking the car 
rattling the surface waves came through and my husband and I were like that was bigger than the 6-4 like uh -oh. and we had just left a restaurant we were in a restaurant it was like and what's crazy about it we were in a hibachi restaurant like one where they cook mm -hmm. at your yeah, table like every table has a gas line right to it yes yeah. <laughs> and it was like what would you have done like and we saw a video of that after the fact of people trying to get out of there and it would have been so scary because you can't duck and cover under a gas grill table. You know, I mean, like you can, oh, but it's not going to. It's not going to work out. Not ideal. Yeah. So it was. Um, so it was pretty crazy to see the video of that. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it ripped open the desert. Um, and the pictures you can find pictures mm. online. They're just super cool and um, just crazy. So, and yeah. I will preface all this by. I am a geologist. There are, were people and are people still that are very freaked out by this, that, um, that it really did. I have friends that moved from Ridgecrest because of it. Um, and you know, it's, it affects people differently. It's going to, this is, it was a very interesting to be a geologist here when all of this was happening and when the USGS was coming and CGS and evaluating it and going out in the desert and finding the actual, um, ruptures and, Wow, it was really interesting. Yeah, I'm, look, I'm looking at the the maximum horizontal slip, so the, the maximum amount one side moved relative to the other side was four meters. Holy cow! <clears throat> yeah. So that's wow. Twelve feet, twelve fifteen, and the maximum vertical movement. So part of the ground moves up, and the other part, you know, doesn't relative to one another. Uh, but it's it's still three point seven meters, so that's like that's that's a like a floor of your house. So it was like, huge. Yeah. Um, I I've seen the offsets. I've gone to those offsets, and the coolest thing to imagine is if you were standing there when that happened, and it'd be like just the ground just ripped from out from under you. I mean, not standing right on the rupture, but standing like you know, <laughs> yeah. back a ways. But if you saw that, it just yeah. would have been so it nuts. Been. And there was some yeah. video people did have, I think there's a video online that just shows the desert, just a big dust fall, just like, because it's going to chuck dust up. It's just all sand, yeah. right? So it, all it does <laughs> is it moves and it just chucks all the sand and dust in the air. And it was just a big like dust cloud. Wow. Yeah. It's like yeah. that scene in uh, The Force Awakens when Starkiller Base starts to disintegrate on itself. <laughs> <laughs> I always, my my go-to is always um, is it Raiders of the Lost Ark where Indian uh, where the earthquake happens and it like opens up right in front of the Nazis and then people start falling down into the the earthquake abyss. Anybody? <laughs> I have no idea what you're I talking about. I did not. Isn't that, that was <laughs> one of my favorite movies and I'm not. Oh, yeah. When, you're talking got, about Raiders of the Lost Ark when they're at the very end. Yeah. Wasn't there something like the the earth opened up? No. Oh, yeah. So all their faces know. melted off. Yeah. I don't know if that's well, tectonic. Spoiler more. alert. Jeez. Oh, sorry. Just kidding. The movie's from the 80s, Kelly. Come on. Just kidding. It was probably before Kelly was born. No, what? I appreciate that, though. Thank you. Me? No, but what's cool, I mean, you didn't see many trenches, so like that, like it wasn't like the earth opened up and like swallowed things. There were, what was really interesting about it, it was like looking at a geology textbook, right? So there were relay ramps um, and there were, when you had a, you had stepovers associated if you had a, um, your left lateral fault would step off to the Northeast and then pick back up and then um, be one complete splay again or actual rupture again. Um, and then what Jesse's talking about with the actual like 3.5 meter offset vertically is it was striking north northwest i'm sorry yeah north north or west but then it jogged it took a jog to the north and where you have those changes in orientation is where you do have things popping up or things opening up so in that situation it took a jog to the north and it pop, it ended up displacing it then vertically so as it's following the strike like following that strike on strike you had that straight up um right lateral motion but then when it would jog to the north or to the west a little bit is where you'd start to have then um areas of some trenching or things that were thrusting and that was so, crazy yeah, that, that was going to be my question it like uh strike slip fault they're just sliding past each other right they're the books on your bookshelf moving in or out 
but then you have uh, a normal fault or a reverse fault where something moves up or something moves down. So is if you have that much vertical displacement of like 12 feet, 15 feet, is it still a strike slip fault? It would be called the transform fault then because it's got, it has lateral offset and horizontal offset or vertical. I'm sorry. So it has horizontal and vertical offset. So it would be considered um, full. Boom. Dropping knowledge bombs. Yeah. This is when I, whenever I teach uh, faults, I'm like, and then there's oblique faults, which we're not going to worry about. Yeah, that's it. Wait for grad school with that one. I always, yeah. I always tell my students, like, <laughs> the twisty you know. ones. Let's not worry about the twisty ones. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good point. Like, you know, that's one thing I, I did note. Like, when you get an undergraduate degree in geology, you learn, like, you know, your, your basic textbook scenarios. And then you go into grad school and you're like, oh, everything that I learned, not everything, but there's so much more. And, like, those textbook scenarios, like, don't really. I mean, they happen, but there's it, things get way, way more complicated than than what you learn, you know, as in your basic undergraduate level class. So basically, you learn that everything in your undergrad is wrong, and you have to relearn everything in grad school. It's not <laughs> wrong. wrong. It's just not wrong. As, I'm being silly. It's not as simple. Yeah, it's not as simple. Nuance. Right. Right. There's yes. nuances. <laughs> like you can have metamorphic rock that still preserves fossils. What? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, a little bit. The trilobites that get squeezed. The yeah, Bella they... Kelly. Remember we did that lab with the Bella Knights. Oh nice. No, I don't remember that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> really made an impression. A Kelly, you were what? there. Come on. A lab for what class? It was <laughs> it, it was in Nick's in our structural or the with Nick's tectonics oh, class in, in that I think lab. I did we're... really bad on that. We all did bad. <laughs> well, Kelly's just blacked it all out. Nope. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> no. Oh, that, that structural geology class? No. I didn't pay attention <laughs> yeah, the to that. One that I'm, I'm just a structural like geologist. Specification. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oops. Oh, this sounds familiar at all. <laughs> um, so to bring it back to the Sorry, geothermal yes. field, that's okay. Uh, Thanks I, for I bringing us the, back in, Kelly. <laughs> I took a tangent. Um, so the 7-1... Um, which has like a whole bunch of different areas now in the USGS are in the process of naming this um, each strand, but it's overall, I think, referred to as Ridgecrest earthquake sequence. And okay. the, so the Northwest striking rupture, which is the seven one strikes right up towards the geothermal field, which is crazy. So I was getting people texting me saying like, uh, you know, is the, are those volcanoes going to erupt soon or like what's going to happen up there? I was like, I think you're fine. Um, you didn't lose any wells or anything? Sure. No. Um, but what's That's interesting awesome. is the um, seismicity then. If you follow the seismicity and you still can see it, um, jumped the geothermal field. So it basically um, just didn't affect the geothermal field in any notable way to date that mm -hmm. we've found. Sounds like some Navy conspiracy. Up. But carry exactly. on. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then it picks up, <laughs> but it does, it, it then strikes basically north south along the Sierra Nevada to the northwest of the geothermal field. So it strikes up towards the geothermal field and then jumps over it and picks up to the northwest of it and starts striking more north south, which follows the orientation of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Now, do you wow. think that's because there was so much uh, lubricate, like there's so much water involved that, that, it's it you know instead of being brittly it became like ductily you know basically instead of breaking it kind of squished i don't so know i, I don't think know. that there's a couple of different reasons that it could be and this is not something we've studied at all but there's been a lot of fluid pushed and pulled through the un the subsurface in the geothermal field for 30 plus years so the assumption then could be, or one of the hypotheses could be, that there's no strain built up on mm. the faults within that area enough that would then lead to larger scale seismicity because there is seismicity within the field itself. Um, yeah, so you, all day, you guys get, you, so you're getting a lot of really small earthquakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. so basically yeah. you've been massaging yeah. them out of the fault zone for 30 years Could so be. It, it wasn't really tense and it wasn't didn't freak out when something came through it was just like yeah, yeah whatever we're cool we're in the navy you know it's fine 
It's all so, gravy in the Navy, baby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what? I've never heard that. <laughs> I'm going to use that. Yeah, um, there you go. But there's two other hypotheses, I guess, you can also um, start to investigate is there's no um, large fault that strikes through, right? So this was a very large fault system that ruptured all at the same time to create a 7.1 magnitude earthquake. That's a lot of ground to move. Mm -hmm. Within the geothermal area, there doesn't seem to be a through going um, northwest striking faults that could then connect to this system. Okay. There's a lot of northeast striking faults and northwest striking faults. It's, it's being actively being extended. That's why it exists where it is. Um, so it's normal faulting. It's a normal faulting environment with some trans tension, but um, it does the stress environment does start to rotate a bit in that area. Um, so it could be because there's just no fault that is big enough to then um, connect it to the Owens Valley fault zone, which ruptured in I think the 1800s, 1872. Then that's to the northwest of us. And then the third one is that the brittle ductile transition is shallower under Coso because there's a magma chamber. So where you do not have mm. brittle rock, like you said, Steve, right. you don't have, you can't have an a earthquake that's going to rupture in that way, right? The rock is going to then only rupture a certain portion of the crust as opposed to a large portion of the crust because it, some of it's brittle. I'm sorry, some of it's ductile. Right, right. <laughs> So it's like trying to uh, break a giant ice cube and then you realize that, oh, it's just ice on the surface and the rest is water. Yeah. yeah. Just you just don't have enough just, surface area to move. Yeah, just not a small. large earthquake. That was a brilliant mm -hmm. analogy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, I will say until you mentioned <clears throat> that there's a magma chamber, I was like, oh yes, that's why you do geothermal out there. <laughs> The ground is mm -hmm. Yes. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, Jesse Thornburg. I'm all caught up. I'm up to speed. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. that's because you're in tension. Is it is it um is the magma chamber there because of decompression melting or is it because of a hot spot? What um, yeah, this is a bit of a digression from the earthquake, but no, that's fine. Um, so it's likely due to just the extension. So there seems to be, and we're not, it's due to the extension through this area. So as you drive through Eastern California, um, the extension that you're seeing on this side of the Eastern Sierra, um, where you have a where you have any normal faults of large scale, you do tend to have then um, volcanic rock associated with them. So it's due to the extension, the active extension. Um, it, I'm not exactly sure what it's doing there, if it's there because of decompression, like you said, um, but it's capable of getting close to the surface because of the extension. Cool. So what's that's the most best I could tell you, I guess. So what's, what's the cause of the extension on the just, um, uh, east of the Sears? Is that, is that, I had heard that it's related to the Farallon plate that was completely subducted underneath North America. I was hoping you were going to pull out some wacky conspiracy theory. Oh, I was going to uh, say aliens, um, but yeah, it it's near Area is, 51, so. The only way to explain it is the Earth is flat. <laughs> <laughs> You're all flat earthers, it, I'm sure. Is it, is it just the, the San Andreas as it's moving, it's just kind of stretching there? Yep. Mm -hmm. the so this is considered the Eastern California shear zone, and it works, it, it's kind of the gateway into the basin and range. So the Eastern California shear zone is everything east of the um, Sierra Nevada. And it, again, it's just that accommodation of the plate boundary. So this side of the Eastern Sierra is just accommodating a ton of the strain from the plate boundary at the San Andreas. Mm -hmm. It just so happens, I don't know if it, there's a weak point. Um, there's, I'm sure you could look up theories about how eventually this is gonna be a, going to be a plate boundary through here. I don't know mm -hmm. anything about any of that, but um, but there have been, I think in my notes, right, there was a 7.5 magnitude earthquake north of us. Um, Landers was a 7.4 and Hector Mine was a 7.1 and then the Ridgecrest sequence. So that's four 7 point plus 0 .0 magnitude earthquakes on this side of the Eastern Sierra Nevada or this side of the Sierra Nevada, yeah, which is pretty great. crazy. In the last hundred years. I mean, that's that's a lot of 
accommodation. That's a lot of mm-hmm. movement. So. Yeah, definitely. So do you want to get on to more of a, the, the regional geologic setting of, of the area? I know you have some... Sure. Uh, um, we could definitely do that. So I don't know how our time's doing or how long you want to talk. Or oh, talk. We're good. We're good. Okay. Um, so if you were to look at a map... Uh, of I'm sorry. We're out of time now, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> You know what? I take it back. <laughs> I'm done. See you later. <laughs> I'm sorry. You just set me up there, so it's fair. Carry on. All right. What uh, Indian Wells Valley? You were yeah. saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you look at a map of Southern California, again, Ridgecrest um, is in the high desert, so it's to the pretty much to the east of Bakersfield. And if you know what the Garlock Fault is, there's um. Uh, nope. the, there's a San Andreas <laughs> Fault, which strikes roughly north-northwest mm-hmm. through California. But then down towards the bottom of California, and it's near San Bernardino, if anybody knows California, there's a fault that then strikes to the northeast, and that's called the Garlock Fault. I thought um, that was Garlock, from Lord of the Rings. No, but, it's okay. a real fault. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and it strikes then to the northeast. Um, it is a left lateral fault i'm just getting my yep it's a left lateral fault which makes sense and coincides with the same orientation of the six four which was in the struck was striking northeast or did strike northeast was also a left lateral um so there's this large fault that you can see if you look at a map of california it strikes to the northeast left lateral um and the indian wells valley is positioned then to the north of that fault so you cross this rather large fault that geologists within California and in this area <clears throat> have really said that that's the fault that could cause some damage if it were to go. Um, so it's another fault that's been pretty heavily studied and it has very large offset. There's volcanics that are like, I don't even know how far. I'm sorry. I couldn't tell you how far, but look it up because it's very far. <laughs> um, <laughs> So this is all occurring then to the north of the Garlock Fault. So it kind of makes this weird triangle area. The Indian Wells Valley makes this weird triangle area that's accommodating this um, this extension. Um, there's been a lot of people from our office, um, a gentleman named Frank Monastero, who's done a lot of work and was the division director of the geothermal program office. who put in a lot of time and sweat and money to study this area Um, and uh, within the Indian Wells Valley it's mostly just um, sediments from the old Owens um, River that used to cut through that valley Um, so it's a Graben West Dipping Graben Um, so we have the Sierra and the western on the western side of the valley is the Sierra Nevada Um, you have a frontal fault from the Sierra Nevada dipping to the east um, and then on the other side of the valley is the Argus Range, and you have a frontal fault dipping to the west. So you have this Graben, and all of this was occurring inside of this Graben, all of this extension. Um, so Kelly, can, we, you go, can you go into just really briefly what exactly a Graben is for some of the listeners that may not know what that term means? Yeah, sure. So a Graben is the general term for, uh, this is very general, and if mm-hmm. I am not saying this correctly, I apologize. So a Graben is a general term for a valley, really, that's um, on both sides has um, ge- dipping, gently dipping normal faults. So it's a valley that has faults, um, normal faults on both sides, um, as opposed to, a, and that's a valley, a horst is when you have normal faults that are dipping away and are then it's a high so a horse is a high with normal faults on both sides dipping away from the center and a graben is a valley that have normal faults on both sides dipping to the middle does that make sense yeah yeah and so the, the main <laughs> thing you get the, the grabens it's well it's all from extension too yeah right. so, you're, and so you're you're pulling apart you're pulling and stuff's it apart. falling down yeah yeah and so that's why essentially we're getting these these the Grobbins, uh, God, it's a you know, super watered down definition, but it's like this, it's like you said, it's this valley that forms from, from extension from the, from the crust ripping apart. I think uh, so, Steve summed it up nicely when he said, you pull apart and stuff falls down. That's, that's, you could have, <laughs> there you go. That's what more you need. This is my uh, intro level to non-science majors <laughs> <laughs> definition <laughs> that I teach every year. Just imagine, you know, you're pulling apart and stuff falls down. Yeah. Once again, <laughs> you're pulling half here. 
if you, if you have saltwater taffy or like laffy taffy, and you're pulling it, parts of it snap and break, and then they dangle down. Those yeah. Are like the blocks there. Yeah. And, then, and then you eat the taffy, and it's delicious. Win <laughs> win. The whole reason Jesse became a geologist. Yeah. <laughs> Andy. So you can, yeah, <laughs> related back to Gandhi. Yeah. So all of this is then occurring or occurred in Indian Wells Valley and a little bit to the, the valley to the south east. Um, but it is a granitic basement, but it's way far down there and just a whole bunch of sediments sitting on top of it. So this fault then ripped through all of that sedimentary rock um, and just um, unconsolidated sediments as well. So I see uh, on the some of the info that you provided us, you said that there's a. You kind of talked just with, with the, about the regional geology. You said there's volcanic or there's there's volcanic flows in this area. When was when was the last time that there was any active volcanic activity, like an eruption? Oh, you're asking me for dates. Um, well, so I'm, within the, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so there's it's a range. So there's um, mm -hmm. within the geothermal field, the most active volcanism is. Um, like 20,000 years, and that's okay. um, argon argon dating, I'm almost certain. Um, but then there's volcanism from like millions of years ago. So, mm -hmm. um, most recently, the volcanism is more felsic and it's um, mm -hmm. rhyolites that mm -hmm. we're getting up there. But then there's also um, the older volcanism is all a lot more mafic. And that's Ooh. more like with the was is the, the older stuff more related to the formation of the Sierra Nevadas? I don't know. Uh, it's a good question. Prob probably the, the timeline, the Sierra Nevadas were uh, at least less than 50 million years old. I want, I, I want to say 20. Uh, yeah, now I'm Balonian, but I want to say 30 to 20 million years old cool. was the Sierra Nevadas because the Rocky Mountains were about 50 million. Did so. you say now I'm Balonian? I'm going to start <laughs> using that one. <laughs> Balonian. Uh, but – 40 million years old, Sierra Nevadas. Like I said, 40 million years old. Yeah, <laughs> That's exactly what I said. <laughs> I don't even know why you checked me, Chris. But, uh, so I don't think this volcanism is as old as 40 million, but um, there's, like I said, there's volcanism all throughout the eastern Sierra Nevada. So I would, mm -hmm. I would assume that there is volcanism that's associated with that. Cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But uh, it is um, worth noting that uh, earthquakes travel much easierly, you know, because that's a word, uh, through unconsolidated sediment as opposed to uh, hard rock. So um, this is another thing. Like, if you're going to move to San Francisco, you really should look at a hazard map to see, like, hey, are you built on, like, a old bay that was just filled in with, like, sediment 150 years ago and if you have an earthquake your building's going to collapse or are you built on solid rock and if you have an earthquake yeah stuff's going to shake but you're still going to have a house the day after so um that unconsolidated unconsolidated sediment just whoop, you know liquefies it uh you know the yeah, earthquake can just obliterate it essentially it's called liquefaction and it's uh, the seismic waves run through that sediment and it just makes that sediment that that loose sediment act like a liquid and things yeah. sink down and buildings fall apart. And it's all oogly googly, I think is the uh, scientific <laughs> term. I think that's, that's, yeah, that's what it says it's in the research close. papers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, come on. Oogly googly is almost as fancy as liquefaction. Come yeah. On. You, get, you did... get a better sense of what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> so we did Kel see, um, like, uh, so there were areas of the fault where we saw sand boils. So yeah, I, I was just um, going to ask really you, cool. what is that the same thing as the sand volcano? I think so. Okay. So um, I think it's just yeah, it gets heated up and just and there's I think it's similar that it gets shaken so much. Not mm -hmm. heated up. I apologize. It gets shaken so much that it liquefies and finds it's, the, like, it's like a sand the geyser, path right? Of resistance. Yeah. Yeah. So we didn't so, see it spurting out, but we saw. The remnant you saw the, the, the you had, had cool. you seen you seen like the mounds the form no they wasn't they weren't that big that'd be cool. okay I, i've oh. seen them in uh it was either idaho or montana where you could actually see the mounds because there was so much displacement oh, 
uh, it, it wasn't uh, sand though. It was the groundwater. Like because there was so much displacement, all of a sudden, all this groundwater was now twenty feet higher than it was before. So it just like uh, rushed up out of the ground and created these geysers oh, cool. of water shooting up, and they they created like these mounds where the water came shooting up from an earthquake. Yeah. Now, wow. imagine, yeah. Imagine you're out in the desert and like you see the ground shift and break, and there's geysers of water and sand boils. Well, I know those are the things where like when you think back to anyone, any native um, peoples that were out here, and if one of this happens, they didn't have access to anything that we have access to now, to just think like, what did we do? You know, like to turn your body, like, what'd you do today? (laughs) You know, like, yeah, he's completely freaked out and assume that you did something. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, for sure. I would get blamed. You need to sacrifice. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. But I understand why it would, that would be scary as hell. Yeah. I know what, when we had, I was in the uh, last, where was it? I guess two years ago, two, three years ago when there was the total solar, I was in the area of totality for the solar eclipse. Oh, that's and, cool. oh, uh, 20, 2017. Yeah. 2017. Yeah. I drove out uh, to see that and that was the eeriest thing. Uh, it was just, you heard, um, like crickets chirping. It got so dark that the like the you heard like the crickets chirp in the middle of the afternoon, and um, that was it was just, that was why I could definitely see like how if if you know before science you know you would think like oh what is this right yeah. <laughs> what happened yeah the world's ending something yeah, there was yeah. this uh, pretty famous like I don't know if it was a mockumentary in the eighties called uh, the gods must be crazy, <laughs> and it was about an indigenous an indigenous tribe where somebody from an airplane like throws out a Coke bottle. So this Coke bottle lands in this indigenous tribe and they all fight over it because they find all these different uses for a Coke bottle. And then the tribe ends up like battling each other and they realize like the gods must be crazy. Why would they give us this thing? Oh if it's God. just going to cause all this strife. So at the end of spoiler alert, the end of the movie, the guy just like throws a Coke bottle off a cliff and another group gets another, it. Yeah, exactly. Tribe finds it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I can't imagine like not having science to, to explain. explain it. Like, yeah. Just just to rely on. Well, we do it this way because we've done it for a thousand years. So and, Ridge Ridgecrest is home to a museum that has petroglyphs, right? And mm-hmm. ooh, neat. Do, do any of the petroglyphs? have like people shaking or stuffing and covering no actually under, that's a good question though <laughs> <laughs> what hiding under the grills of benihanas on, oh, on petroglyphs no no yeah. um no um no volcano so, pictures or anything oh. i don't think so that's a good question they're usually pictures of some um animals and people usually is what they're pictures of, usually people. So there's, so up in um, China Lake, so you can take a tour um, up into this canyon. So those same volcanic rocks, the basalts, um, are nice and dark. So the native people around here would draw on them. And um, they're called petroglyphs, are these drawings on, um, basalts is where what we see them on here in this part of the country anyway. Um, but there's a tour and you can go up and it's the largest concentration of um, petroglyphs. I want to say in the country, um, wow. but I'm not sure that that's exactly true, but it's this Canyon. So it was um, a basalt flow that then was carved out by water over time. And so there's just this Canyon walls of basalts and it's just all the way down. Um, it's like a, whole a bunch giant of- natural chalkboard. Yeah, it's really. Except, I mean, it's really interesting. And I guess uh, a chalkboard cool. would be slate, but I, I, I've, I've, seen <laughs> of, uh, I've seen a lot of petroglyphs in, in my day. I've seen a lot of petroglyphs. Uh, in I, I've seen a lot of petroglyphs in Utah. And man, now I, I get why the crazy alien guy on the History Channel. A lot of their characters have really crazy heads and stuff. They're all like, I don't know. You're like, ooh, that does look like an old alien, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, that's just me. That's, that's the whole premise of Prometheus, which that's a good movie. That's part of our uh, intro. Yeah, that's what, 
in the uh, in the intro for the, in the intro song when they oh um, yeah it is it's for, like the, the one line from prometheus yeah yeah <laughs> that poor guy never stood a chance spoiler alert I think they all died. Does everyone die in that? Yeah, except for that one woman and the she, robot. She eventually. Uh, I've never seen it. Mm. You've yeah, never seen not, Prometheus? It's not no. that great. Do you, it's, Steve, I do know. you like sci fi movies? Oh, yes. No, I love Prometheus. All right, I'm going to have to check it out. Mm, I'm going to stay up till 2 a.m. I've seen all of those stupid alien have. movies now. I like it. I'll send it to you. I got the um, uh, what? I got the, the DVD with like the first, the, the, like, I guess like the original four alien movies on it number one was the best number two bill paxton's horrible aliens couldn't uh and then i i haven't even gotten to number three or four yet so is that is number two <laughs> where he's like game over, man, game over. is that Wait, what bill paxton yeah the, they had like the marines come in and like it was yeah yeah one, i rewatched one a couple of years ago man it is still terrifying the first yes. one the first one holds up great yeah, hmm. but I uh, the second one was garbage. Don't waste your time. <laughs> I would I wouldn't go that the far. Most, it was still a good movie. <laughs> the most recent movie that I've watched with Bill Paxton is Newsies the other night for the first Newsies. time, which was awesome and delightful. It's that that's like a what, when did that was that like nineteen ninety two ninety three. Yeah, it was back there. Christian Bale. I am Christian Bale's in Newsies. Christian Bale's in Newsies? He's dancing and singing in Newsies. Look it up and watch it. Wow. Is that on Disney Plus? It is on Disney Plus. That's why I watched it. Man, I'm I'm not getting any sleep tonight. How about that? Yeah, I I typed in Newsies, and the first thing that, second thing that pops up is Newsies Christian Bale age. So I don't know. I don't know what that means. He's like, no, he was like 18, I think. We looked it up too, how old he was in that. I think he was. He was in his late teens. I'm pretty oh sure. Oh my god! Look at that. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was he was delightful. seventeen. Never yeah, seen so, it. Wow. So I'm younger than Christian Bale. I got that going for me, which is nice. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's that's about it. So, um, um all right. <laughs> is that a slow clap, Chris? What was that? What was what? I thought it was a slow clap you were doing there. Oh, oh no, no I, was, I, I put my phone, my watch down. That's oh, I was like, like sorry. I, I thought Seminex was just clapping. <laughs> <laughs> no, Kelly's, Kelly's, uh, she's just you know punching stuff and she's all angry. She's, Come yeah, on, yeah. Mm. get back to the earthquakes, newsies. Uh, <laughs> no, dude, how random would it be if you had an earthquake right now? <gasps> We've had a lot since then. A lot. <sighs> we just had one not that long ago. I guess it was like a four. Um, but yeah, getting good at guessing the magnitudes. And, so what's a um, what's a four feel like? I've been told that it feels like a tractor trailer coming down the street. Yeah, I could see that. It's still, um, you can still feel the P waves because everything's occurring pretty close to us, and then it's just mm-hmm. like just a shaking motion. Um, mm-hmm. So how's your but how's depending your house upon, hold up? Luckily, well, I mean that's one of the things that after the fact, um, we had some buddies over and we were just sitting around a fire pit in the backyard just drinking beers and um i was like if you would have told me four days ago that we'd be sitting in this backyard drinking beers around a fire and we had had a 6.4 and a 7.1 mad earthquake right over there i would have called you a freaking <laughs> liar like it's amazing nice there are things in town that have damage so the um the base definitely has some damage because it was mainly occurred on the installation mm-hmm. um so the base has some damage and then the movie theater um the ceiling collapsed on one side of the movie theater as well so there's still part of the movie theater that's not open here because of it oh wow well, and same thing it well, happened early in the morning on july 4th so there was nobody in the theater that's awesome um and because of that then people closed down businesses and so when the seven one happened except for obviously the restaurant i went to um there weren't <laughs> a lot of people then in many like in the movie theater because the i think the ceiling collapsed at the 6-4 so there was no one in the theater and so um there was one gentleman that did die in Pahrump, Nevada which is pretty crazy but he had um his car was up on lifts oh no and he was working on, yeah he was working under it and it fell off the lifts that's terrible so that was the only that was the only death associated with these two earthquakes um, as far as I know you bring up Nevada and maybe I don't want to stretch this out too long here but does you know, this, it was edited down. Yeah, does this shears up editing? 
<laughs> Editing, that's funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> you crazy. <laughs> the shear zone, does this affect into Nevada like Yucca Mountain when that was still being talked about as being the nuclear repository? That, I don't know. I um, that, like, like this whole um, accommodation, you mean? Yeah, like would these earthquakes affect that as a potential nuclear repository? That's a good question. Um, that would be really interesting for someone to go and um, check out the test set, that test area and see if there was any offset associated with it. So um, how far are you from Yucca Mountain? Uh, Jesse looks like he's got a map up. Jesse, how far are we from Nevada <laughs> Test Center? Looking up right now. Um, I, and I, yeah, I would assume that there was no offset over there um, associated with the the Ridgecrest earthquake sequence, but the amount of shaking that occurred there and what that would have, how that would have affected anything stored there, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Sorry, that was me again. Put my watch down. I need to stop playing with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, I, it, it, it can't calculate. It, what? <laughs> it's, it's so far. That sounds like some type of conspiracy for sure. Yes. I don't know, it looks like 100 miles. All right. Okay. So. That, that was this was Thornberg holding up his thumb to the scale bar on Google Maps and be like, yeah, it's about 100 miles. I could open up a program, but I don't want to. No, it's, it's, yeah, um, I don't. I'm not sure. That's a that's a really good question though, and how that shaking yeah. or any shaking close to that area then has affected um, the subsurface. There would be an interesting. I'm sure they've studied it. Um, and I've met now geologists living out here. I've met people that worked on that um, site for quite a while. So that's been pretty interesting to run into people that were mapping the structures through the tunnels and because they had a, are, to make a super detailed geologic map, especially structurally. To make are, sure they still, they weren't. are they still working on Yucca Mountain or is it, uh, I thought I'd heard that they put the kibosh on that whole thing. Yeah, so, I think, I believe that was when Obama was president that he put the final like, Close well, down and, and that's what I thought. Yeah, I think the new administration. What'd you say? I think the new administration is just, uh, just from brief looking at it, it, looks like they're letting things go now. So they're. Oh, that's, there's operation now? I don't know if it's operation, but they're back in. Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. So it looks like they're fighting now between the federal government and the state of Nevada. Yeah, it's uh, it's seems... so the lawyers are involved. Yeah, no, it just uh, all right. Well, we we can <laughs> the... talk about this at a different the... No, well, but the, it's super. The whole... I mean, Nevada's test site is super interesting. Like it was, <laughs> and it's with anything that happens with geology, right? You, it was um, a job for many geologists to be in there mapping those structures and mapping the geology through that area. So when they closed it down um, environmentally for that area it was probably a success, but there were a lot of the jobs and geology jobs associated with that site then. Um, so it's another interesting, similar to any, you know, environmental problem in the country. There's, yeah. Yeah, so, but I, I heard it was a lot of politics. Like basically when they proposed that site, it was Nevada had a lot of young senators who didn't have much clout and everybody huh. else in the country was like, no, I don't want that in my state. <laughs> And they were like, well, you know, well, let's listen. Maybe this will be some good funding. And it's like, no, you, it's going to be a bunch of nuclear waste in your backyard. Like, and don't get me wrong. There's no answer for it. Like, I don't know mm -hmm. where this stuff's going now. I honestly have no idea. I don't know if it's Yucca, but one of the big things with the Yucca was like just transporting it. Like, yeah, yeah. You had to get there. Want it transporting through there. But I know one of the sites, I don't know if it was a Yucca, it was somewhere out there. I don't know. The West is all the same to me. No offense. To me. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, but we what, found that out last week. Didn't you mention that last week that you basically just like West Coast geology, no dice? Yeah. It's not, Nothing matters to Jesse that's outside of like a 10 mile radius of where he's at. It's, yeah. it's very yeah. localized. Well, one of the, one of the sites uh, is pretty interesting because it's I'm pretty sure it's in, it's part of like a, a salt dome or a salt complex. Hmm. And that they essentially want to store it. They've caved it out. And one of, I think they actually started storing waste in it. 
and it's slowly the salt is slowly encapsulating it. Oh, yes. oh it's, so it's flowing. Like it. But I, I thought that I thought that was the plan for Yucca Mountain. Too. It might have been, but I know yeah, Yucca yeah. Mountain had salt involved because they wanted to. That was the indicator that there wasn't uh, water. There was pretty, there was no groundwater. Yeah, but I thought they still were picking up radiation in the salt or something because they didn't. Anyway. Anyway, yeah. that's a, that sounds like a topic for another. Yeah, Kelly, what are you doing in three weeks? <laughs> yeah. I I, I want to know. I got a Let's really important research. question, <laughs> Kelly. Talk about conspiracy theories. How far are you from Area Fifty One? Yeah, let's um, let's north, storm it. it. It's north of Vegas. Um, so north however, I forget which. That's uh, which installation is that? Uh, but um, my right in your backyard, I think. <laughs> so my, Come um, on, this is all really important stuff we need to know about <laughs> one of my coworkers has a, a kind of a funny story about it because our one of our jobs is to explore for geothermal on department of defense lands that's part of our job and in doing so then you look for areas where there's faults that are intersecting or stepovers and faults or term, fault terminations those are the type of places where you potentially have a geothermal resource and so he was in a room with somebody um, supposedly, in a room with somebody that worked then over at Nellis. Nellis. Nellis is that what it is? Nellis. Um, and uh, kind of pointed to an area and was like, this is where we want to do some exploration work. It seems like it's the most, has the most potential structurally, um, structurally, geo geologically anyway. And they were like, why there? And they were like, well, you know, there's this fault intersection here and here. And it just seems like it might be the area that would be the most interesting. And they were like, you're not allowed in there. <laughs> Turned out that was like area no, 51. Like you're well, not going then, in there to do the anything. Nevada, nice try. And the Nevada test site too. Um, that's all DOD, and that's like really like just stay away from that. They no one's no one's going there. Whatever happened with that whole storming area 51? They just went and like had a, a costume party and like hung out. Everyone right <laughs> outside of the gate. I think. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the. the uh, world released covid so they wouldn't do it right oh really yeah, yeah that's con that's a good conspiracy theory <laughs> a conspiracy happen, theory though? on top of a conspiracy i actually have no idea I, I remember reading about it what months ago weeks ago like everything like everything's fall. a blur now i, I you know, know right yeah so, I, I put on a shirt today that's <laughs> it's a big day <laughs> it is <laughs> and it's flannel for those who are complaining about us not wearing flannels. Yeah, you guys have two people in flannel shirts. Yeah, thanks, um, Chris. Yeah. I'm in, I'm in stripes. I did not get the memo. Sorry. Mm. You got you got half the flannel shirt, Kelly. You need yeah. Perfect. I need the stripes. other direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah the <laughs> other direction. You're, you're there. Mm. Yeah. So what what do you got going on? Uh, what's coming up in your horizon, Kelly? What's uh, at work? What kind of stuff you you working on in the near future? So the Department of Energy just had out. Um, a couple of funding or a few funding requests. So our office was putting in for some funding from the Department of Energy to do some exploration, geothermal exploration up in Nevada, um, to do some work on a well in the geothermal field. Um, and um, for also a direct use project up at a army base in Nevada. Um, place called Hawthorne, Nevada. There's an army base there and we've done a lot of work there already. So we're trying to get a direct use geothermal project off the ground, which just means directly using the fluid to um, heat um, whatever you need to be heated. So heating a boiler, offsetting the heating of a boiler to mm -hmm. decrease some energy costs, or if you can directly use that fluid to um, potentially heat or cool a home, usually heat a home, um, so that's what direct use is, as opposed to when it flashes the steam to the temperature and creates energy. So there's different types of geothermal. That's very mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the, that's really what we have going on right now. Our seismic network actually has been pretty wonky since the events in July. So we've done a lot of troubleshooting with our, the network that's up at the coastal geothermal field. Um, so we've had kind of our hands full with trying to get that back up in fully operational over the last however many 10 months or so um so that's been a lot of our time as well um we are about to go out and collect some gravity data up in the geothermal field it's something that we can do individually and something that so with covid um we haven't been going out in the field very much 
because we're not supposed to be traveling with more than one person. Mm -hmm. um, but we can collect using a gravimeter, um, collect gravity measurements. So we're probably going to be doing that coming up here when we get our replacement batteries. Nice. That's heavy, man. Oh, <laughs> see oh, what I did there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> we did do, um, and I would have been at a conference in um, Iceland at the end of uh, April, and I wasn't, obviously, which was a bummer. Oh. It's called the World Geothermal Congress. That would have been awesome. Um, I know. And my, we were going to make it a vacation. It was going to be a whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So we had to cancel that. But I was supposed to present on a shallow temperature survey we did up at the geothermal field, which was really cool. So. Um, I think I explained this last time, but <clears throat> we drive a two meter long probe into the ground and put a thermometer down it or a thermistor down it, let it equilibrate for an hour and take its temperature, mm -hmm. um, the temperature of the shallow ground. And so that was neat because we were, um, we put those all over the geothermal field to see um, what the shallow ground temperature variation was. And that was really interesting and mainly, which isn't shocking. But still neat. It followed the surface manifestations because there's a lot of hot springs and um, oh, cool. fumaroles, which are steam um, being ejected out of the ground. Um, so it followed them, um, which isn't necessarily surprising, but it's something we didn't know previously. And part of that ground up there has evolved over time to be warmer than it used to be. So we're trying to then relate what we're seeing at the shallow surface. Um, so changes in shallow temperature to changes um, in the subsurface and in the reservoir itself. So what can the changes at the surface tell us about how the actual geothermal reservoir has evolved over time? That's very cool. So because obviously measuring the temperature at the surface is a gazillion, you know, again, a gazillion times cheaper. You know, yeah. <laughs> you can take a geoprobe and stick a bunch of holes in the ground for relatively nothing as compared to drilling one geothermal well and doing all that testing. So that's really, really cool. Yeah. And as yeah, a sidebar, because we never do sidebars on the show. Um, never. <clears throat> uh, so I just had my 15 year wedding anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. congratulations. Um, but so for 15 years, I've been asking my wife, like, can we please go to Iceland? And I've still never been. So. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say we're going. <laughs> no, yeah. no. The to, World Geothermal Congress was just postponed until next May. Ah, right. So, I like it. That's my next 16 year anniversary is the old. Uh, let's make it a whole flannel cast. Oh, let's do it. Yes. You should go. I'll go. Yep. Yeah. So when my wife listens to this podcast tomorrow, <laughs> <laughs> she can start planning, you know. So Jesse and Chris, if you get emails from her, it'll be a, it'll be about... a tax write off. I don't know how taxes <laughs> Yeah. Are. I have no For idea. sure, that's that's definitely probably how that works. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna find out. Yeah, no, it, it's what's the worst that happens. <laughs> yeah, could you? Megan would be so mad <laughs> if you're just like, and these guys are coming too, and they just yeah. turn up at the airport because I would just bags. be nerding out about rocks the whole time. She'd be like, you know what? That's it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to Greenland. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, well, Kelly, thank you for this plethora of knowledge. As always, we really appreciate you coming on the show again. Uh, and uh, for those of you, obviously, none of you can see, but Kelly gave us notes and <laughs> papers to review and yeah, and those timelines. Papers, if, you, and, <laughs> if you can put them on your website, that would be awesome. Yes. Um, I did want mm -hmm. to give a shout out because um, I'm one. One of like, a, you know, a few geologists here in town, but there were a ton, a ton of people working on the Ridgecrest earthquake and continue to work on the Ridgecrest earthquake sequence. So Ken Hudnut from the USGS was super integral. Um, Tim Dawson from the CGS. Um, there were some uh, just crazy amounts of people out here who were just awesome the entire time and yep. really enjoyed Steve, working with them. Stephen Bork, uh, Frank Monestro. Monastero. Monastero. I did already drop him. So yeah, she did. Again. Yep. Um, and yeah, again, every paper that we put on the website, you know, it's just five bucks a month, Kelly. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> on Patreon. <laughs> uh, the last time I was on, I just checked episode 15. 
October of 2014. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So six every years six ago. years, we'll have you on. Perfect. <laughs> sounds, sounds about right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, well, thank you guys for having me. I was stoked to see that you guys were back um, doing, getting after it on the podcast. I've listened to both of your new ones. And yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And keep on keeping on. Yeah. Thank you so life's, much for coming life's on. Life's a garden. Kelly. Dig it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, I guess we wrap things up. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So check out our advertisers, um, the formatting formula, uh, formatting formula.com. They'll hook you up. Tell them the flannel cast sent you. Um, check out our yeah. YouTube page. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've been putting, I've been trying to put up, uh, the full, the full podcast on YouTube. If you want to watch the, you know, watch our beautiful faces. Um, and then uh, some shorts. If you don't have time to watch the whole podcast, uh, a couple of little little shorts yeah, just thrown in there. Pictures of Chris in shorts. Just being shorts. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> just different ones. Yeah. I don't know how to respond. Like, to what that. do you think of these? <laughs> yeah. What do you think of these ones? These are camo. <laughs> these are board shorts. Yeah. These are yeah. cargo pants. Hot pants. Hot <laughs> pants. No, you got to be on Patreon for that. That's a, that's a, that's a $10. That's one of the things, people. yeah, one yeah. of the things you can get. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, check us out on Geology Flannelcast, uh, our, our YouTube channel. Um, Twitter at GeoFlannelcast. Facebook.com slash Geology Flannelcast. And Patreon. Uh, Patreon. Go to Patreon if you want to, if a couple of listeners. Patreon.com slash. Many, many, many listeners slash. have been telling us how they want to help us out. Yes, and yes. So, um, if you, you know, if you'd be so kind, just throw, throw a few shekels our way, I guess. Um, yeah. no, uh, so that's what's your patreon.com slash geology flannel cast. And, uh, I think that's pretty much it with all the social media and stuff. So, um, that's it. So thanks for tuning in everyone. Really appreciate yeah. everyone taking their time. Listen to this. Uh, we love our fans. We've got the coolest fans in the world and, uh, Oh, send in some questions too. If you, uh, in the future, when we do a listener questions episode, you can go to geologyflannelcast.com and, uh, and submit a geology, earth science, environmental science unit. Just send any question, really. We'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> right. Seriously? And if you, if you do have questions, theories, I'd love that. Term, if you do have questions for me or you want to clarify something or something I said was incorrect and you're like, I need to tell this lady what the deal is Listen, send it to lady. these guys yeah. they can send it to me and i can answer questions if you have any or yes. simply want to tell and me don't worry we'll send it to correct. four other kelly blakes <laughs> yeah. as well yeah <laughs> kelly, a lot of people one of them will get it. there <laughs> kelly what's your what's your twitter do you want to throw your twitter handle out no that's a good question uh, no if you want to if you want to yeah just contact that, us I, I, yeah you can just contact them and yeah. i do usually post and like all their stuff so it's not that hard to find me on uh social media if you're looking for me Woo. all right well thanks so much kelly everyone yes. have a good week and we'll see you guys next week thanks love you guys see you